And I know that some of you have really been uh, digging into the, the book of Matthew. In fact, I was talking with Kurt before service, and he was saying, hey, I was reading ahead, and I got some questions for you. Uh, and I was like, well, I don't know. So we're, we're talking through uh, some of the things in the, in the gospel. You know, like Sandy said, the Word of God is not just a, a, an accomplishment. It's not just material to go over. The Word of God is, is a powerful guide for our lives. And as we look into it, you know, I, I don't care how many times I've read the Gospel of Matthew, every single time that we're looking, I'm looking into this, we're studying, the Lord is showing new, new ways, new ideas, new thoughts. Uh, about about who and and who Jesus is and how we find him and so uh, it's pretty amazing and wonderful so chapter two uh, we're going to come uh, in the in the gospel of Matthew to the oh, little town of you you guessed it Bethlehem little town of Bethlehem and so um, whereas in Luke's gospel at our Christmas Eve services we'll have the reading of the story in Luke chapter two of the circumstances that led Mary and Joseph to go to Bethlehem. And we know that there was a census that required everyone to return to the hometown of their, their family, their ancestral hometown. And the Gospel of Luke tells us that because, and, and we know that both Mary and Joseph's families, but uh, particularly uh, Joseph's family uh, hailed from the line of David and his hometown is Bethlehem, that they went there to uh, comply with the census and to pay the tax to be counted as a part of uh, the Roman census issued by uh, the emperor. But Matthew speaks no such details. In fact, Matthew's less concerned about how Mary and Joseph got to Bethlehem and brings sheds more light, and there's a pun intended in that, on how uh, three extraordinary visitors also came to Bethlehem, which is what we'll look at today. And so um, I'm going to ask you, we're, we're going to do a little bit of working out today. You've been up and down in worship and singing. I'm going to ask you to stand, if you will, and you're able one more time. We're going to read uh, Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12 together. We'll read it out loud. Uh, there are a couple of names in here. Uh, the name Judea, which you're familiar with, Bethlehem, which I'm sure won't throw anybody for a loop. We see, um, let's see here, I'm looking through the list, Magi, Magi, that's how we pronounce that. And uh, so if, you, if you're, if you come to that place and you go, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, that's why we all read out loud and together. It just sounds like, mm, 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 mm. and so um, anyway, you know, reading out loud the scripture is not just a tradition. It's not just something that we do, but it is, it is for a number of reasons. One, we stand and we read out loud to show honor, to show deference. The Bible actually tells believers to be committed to the public reading of Scripture. That as we read it together, as we listen to our own voices make noise, as we hear others speak it, it shows what is the most important thing in this gathering, and that is the Word of God which reveals the person of Jesus Christ. So we read with faith, we read with joy, and we read out of obedience today. You with me? Yes. All right, good news. Okay, so let's read out loud and together, starting in verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, Report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. After hearing the king, they went their way. And the star, which they had seen in the east, went on before them, until it came and stood over the place where the child was. When, the, when they saw the star, 
they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshiped him. Then, opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. Let's pray together one more time. Father, we're grateful that your word not only records this magnificent story of the miraculous birth of Jesus, but also that it points us to the very same Jesus. So today we consider the prophecies. Today we consider the historical record. Today we consider the good news and the plan of God to reconcile us to himself. So we thank you for your word. We just pray that you would open our hearts and minds uh, to receive it by faith, to believe, and to live according to what we have read and what we read in the rest of your word. We pray this in Jesus' good name. Amen. Amen. Thanks. You can be seated. It's interesting, this story here of, of the, the little town of Bethlehem. You know, uh, oftentimes we picture in our minds the, the, night, the day of Jesus' birth, the night of his birth, the, the visit of the shepherds and the angels, which Luke tells us about, and the wise men. In fact, in nativity scenes in our houses, we have all of these together, but just looking at the order of events and putting together the biblical record here, uh, we see here indeed that the wise men did not come to visit at the birth of Jesus. These three visitors didn't come to visit at the birth of Jesus, uh, for they didn't find him in a manger as the shepherds found him. And by the way, the shepherds found him in the manger at the instruction of the angels that pointed them specifically and said, here is a sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And a manger is not particularly a fitting furniture for a house. A manger is particularly fitting furniture for a stable, for a place where animals feed. A manger is indeed a, the, the, the place that um, animals feed out of. It's the, the animal feed trough. <laughs> it just doesn't sound as warm and very nativity-like for us to say feed trough. You will find him in a trough. Um, you know, in fact, uh, many archaeologists and historians look at the uh, first century tools and materials available and, and have actually uncovered uh, many such mangers that were in fact not crafted out of what we particularly see out of the wood, you know, what we, we have today, but out of actually carved out of rock, out of stone, basalt. Uh, and so when we think about uh, the baby Jesus lying in a manger uh, of stone, it uh, reminds us in fact of the crucified Jesus laying in a tomb, laying on a stone, his body prepared uh, to wait for the miracle of God in resurrection. Uh, but again, we, we digress a little bit from the story of Matthew. Matthew tells us uh, from a different perspective, and I've tried to point that out over the last couple of weeks, that, that the Gospels differ in the telling of their accounts, and the differing of their telling does not conflict with one another. In fact, the, the telling and the difference of the telling actually paints a beautiful and rounded picture. The Magi came and visited, found, found Jesus and the mother, Mary, in a house. And uh, so, so Luke tells us the way in which the circumstances that got them to Bethlehem. It was not really of their own deciding, but everybody, everyone uh, had to respond to the census decree that was issued by Caesar Augustus. And as they went from their hometown or to the place of their ancestral hometown, everybody had to do it. So that's how they got on the path to Bethlehem. Matthew seems more concerned uh, about why. Not how, but why. Matthew points us to a prophecy out of the book of Micah that tells us that it was out of Bethlehem that the Messiah would be born. So why did Mary and Joseph get to Bethlehem? We might want to point the finger and point the blame at Caesar who made some poor pregnant lady travel on a donkey uncomfortably all the way. You know, we go, oh, poor Mary. But it wasn't Caesar's fault. In fact, it was the very plan of God. And it was set forth many, many generations before that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. That's why they were there. And it's interesting to note that here we see 
that it's li it could be up to two years later that this story takes place. And some of these details come to us as we follow the rest of the story. Herod's inquiry about the exact time when the star appeared and all these things. But it was God who brought them there. And they ended up apparently staying in Bethlehem. It doesn't take too much extrapolation from the story to figure out why they would stay in Bethlehem. You know, we pointed out the controversy that would arrive with Mary being with child. Uh, really, the, the hurried uh, marriage of the two of them, or marriage ceremony. And we talked last week about the difference between betrothal and the period of betrothal and then the, the wedding ceremony and how Mary and Joseph would have been during that period of one year of betrothal before their wedding ceremony. But they went ahead and got married. So the explanation, the family drama, and all of the small town Nazareth gossip and all of that, Mary and Joseph were probably eager to stay away from Nazareth for at least a year. And, uh, and so we see that they were in Bethlehem. Bethlehem is a significant place. Bethlehem is a significant place for a lot of reasons. In fact, I would tell you this much right now, that probably two of the most significant figures in the history of the Bible, and indeed in the history of, of world events, were born in the city of Bethlehem. Two. Uh, first and foremost, we glossed over the city of Bethlehem in the story of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. In the genealogy of Jesus, we see father to, father to son, father to son, father to son, and then I pointed out that there, are, uh, there were four, and if we count Mary, five women who were distinctly called out of the story, one of which was a woman named Ruth. Bethlehem is where the story of Ruth takes place. Bethlehem is where Ruth encountered and met Boaz. Boaz, who was the man whose field she was gleaning in. She was gleaning because Bethlehem was a very fruitful place. In fact, it is the breadbasket of Judea. It's a part of that, that land where uh, Mary was, or excuse me, Ruth was gleaning in the fields of, of Boaz during the harvest season and grain and barley. The barley harvest is what she was particularly gathering in. And you know, this wonderful place where, you know, things grow, things grow. So Bethlehem is the place where we read of Ruth and Moab, who we, we read further down the story that was the descend or the great grandparent of King David, who also was born in Bethlehem. David was born in Bethlehem. Now you may in your mind think of Bethlehem as this beautiful ancient sprawling city, but even when you go there today, it is a fairly sleepy little town. Bethlehem is about six miles of a journey south of Jerusalem, south of Jerusalem. It's six miles through the foothills south of Jerusalem. Uh, there are beautiful fertile fields that are interspersed with little limestone outcroppings and basalt outcroppings where caves are frequently found. It is in such caves that shepherds would take shelter, sheep would be around in the hills. You can look at the hills around there and then uh, in Bethlehem itself, would have simply been a very small village, although it was significant in that it was the birthplace of King David, which is the first of these two world-shaping historic figures. World-shaping historic figures, David being born there. Although it was his birthplace, it paled in comparison to kind of political significance to Jerusalem. David's capital wasn't in the place of his birth, place of his birth was another sleepy little town of Bethlehem, but Jerusalem was the place where eventually the capital uh, of David's rule would be. In fact, it was the place where uh, the temple would be built by his son Solomon, is the place that the angel showed them. Um, so Bethlehem is significant. The name Bethlehem uh, literally means this. Uh, in, the, in the Hebrew name is Bethle Bethlehem. It means house of bread. House of bread. It's significant because of the, the region of Bethlehem. It was very fruitful in growing grain and growing uh, wheat and growing barley. It was a place where stuff really grew and, and bread could be provided. It's also significant in that name as we look at it from a Christian perspective. It is the, the, the place of birth, not only of David who was promised an eternal kingdom, but of Jesus. Jesus who said this of himself, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. And if we think of the, the house of bread 
as being that place where, where every time we receive communion together, we, we break the bread and, and we say this, we, the, rem, the reminded words of scripture, this is my body. What is this bread that you break which is broken for you? It is in the house of bread that God has supplied for each and every one of us the bread of life, Jesus himself. And so, you know, even in the details, there is great uh, beauty, great significance. But it is the, the birthplace of both of these figures. And so uh, it's important that it takes place there. Now, we think, uh, you know, a six-mile journey uh, doesn't take too long, even if you're on foot. It's, it's an afternoon's walk. It's a morning's walk, whatever it might be. And so as this story goes, let's just jump into some of these details here. It just says, after the birth, in verse 1, after the birth, or after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in the days of Herod the king. This is an important sentence because it places a historical moment, an historical moment. It, uh, the record of Herod the king, who's also referred to as Herod the Great. We'll get to there in a minute, but I'm convinced that that's a nickname he gave himself. Uh, we'll talk about greatness uh, here in a little bit. But uh, he was great by many standards, but uh, he is a very well-known uh, figure to history. He is very, there, there's, there's very few people. In fact, you'd have to find uh, uh, somebody who just simply hates the Bible so much that would argue that Herod the Great never existed. I mean, there is so much archaeological evidence, so much historical evidence, literary evidence. It is a generally accepted fact, not only that he existed, but when he existed. So we know uh, the time in which Jesus was born, but we're introduced to these uh, magi who from the east arrived in Jerusalem. And this story is interesting, and I'd like to, to dig into a couple of things here. Uh, we, we have these visitors, and they're essentially unknown to the other gospel writers. I, I wouldn't say unknown. They are untold of the other gospel writers. In fact, Matthew, as we walk through it throughout the course of the season ahead, uh, has many details that you think, wow, that's a big deal that the other gospel writers do not include in their story. And again, it points to each of these gospel writers under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit are writing from a different purpose or a different angle of pointing the way to Jesus Christ. And so different parts of the story get amplified or get drawn out or get, get uh, put into this, this thread that is being weaved for the purpose that the Holy Spirit is working through that gospel writer. And Matthew has been telling us all the way up to this point, all the way through chapter 1, that Jesus Christ is the rightful and legal heir to the throne of David. He is the rightful legal heir as the king of Israel. And these magi who visit from the east actually only underscore that fact. And the, the behavior of them as they follow the miraculous sign that led them only shows to us that they assumed and rightfully knew that the one who was born was the rightful and prophesied and proclaimed king of the Jews. It's interesting, some commentators have pointed out that Jews, particularly in the first century and historical world, were not highly revered by the communities and cultures around them. In fact, they were derided and looked down upon by many of the cultures around them, which is a favor that the Jews returned to each of those cultures themselves. There was not high esteem across, but we see here that these magi have a, varying, a very different perspective. Some, uh, when we say, we're told that they are visitors from the east. Church history uh, points out a little bit more detail, but when we look at just the biblical account, the biblical account, this is what we have to go on. They were from the east. Now, if you're looking at a map, and you look at Jerusalem, you look at Bethlehem, you point to the east, man, you got a lot of material to work with. But in particular, uh, these, uh, these visitors would be likely those who have come from what we would call modern day Iran or ancient Persia. Uh, they would likely have been those who had interaction with the, the Jewish exiles from the Babylonian and Persian exile. Uh, Daniel himself, lived among them, and, and we know that Daniel had record of the ancient prophets, that he was reading, for instance, the scroll of the prophet Jeremiah, that the other prophets would have been there, and Daniel was a reader of these things, and the Persians were particularly skilled and interested in the reading of ancient scrolls from all cultures, and also in the studying of the natural universe. 
is studying, uh, for instance, the movement and motion of the heavenly bodies, the stars, the planets, the moon, the sun, and, and they had very well-written records and very, uh, very uh, high understandings of the orbits of such planets and navigation by such orbits of these planets. You know, we think that our, we're so sophisticated with our GPSs and everything, but I'm telling you right now, if the power went out, you couldn't even hardly find your way to Safeway. Let's be honest. Let's be honest, if that little lady wasn't talking to you on your dashboard, m many of us wouldn't even know how to get home after church today. And I jest, I joke a little bit, but you know, the skill of navigation by observing the clues around us is something that the ancient world uh, knew a lot about. And the Persian culture, the Persians, uh, very, very well learned in many of these. So we, we can assume that these visitors uh, were from the east, likely from Persia, and likely their knowledge of the ancient prophecies came by interaction with the Jewish exiles. So we see this, that they were, they were in the same sense that Joseph and Mary were navigating the details of their life by prophetic revelation. Mary, by the visit of the angel Gabriel, Joseph, by the visit of an angel of the Lord in his dreams, who gave them clear details of where to go, what to do, and how to do it. These magi were also paying attention to signs. Although we do not read of a specific visit of an angel or a specific detail that God spoke to them, we do see that they were paying attention to the clues that the whole world should have been paying attention to. You know, we see uh, just d proclaimed even in nature prophecy. Uh, some, let's look at the star for just a moment. Uh, the star of Bethlehem. Maybe as you uh, have driven around the neighborhood, you've seen a new addition to our campus this year. Pastor Dane and his son Brandon have been working on a project there. It's, I call it the star of Bethlehem. And if you haven't seen it out there on the, one of the light standards out on the, the, the field there, there's a 60-foot star, or the star is on top of the 60-foot pole with lights coming down. And I looked at it and it just came to me. It's the little star of Bethlehem. And so, um, you know, you can see it from a long ways away. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful, bright star. But the star that guided these magi, the star of Bethlehem, uh, is indeed a prophetic guidance to the person and birth of Jesus Christ. And by the way, it wasn't just something that appeared 2,000 years ago. It was something that was foretold even in the oldest of the scriptures. So this star, many have walked through various exercises of trying to understand what it was. And there are a lot of wonderful explanations. You know, some have, have a gestured that maybe it was a comet. Uh, you know, maybe it was uh, the, the, um, the, co the coalescing of various planets in their orbits. Uh, some have, have guessed that it possibly was the connection of the planet Jupiter and the brightest star in the constellation Leo that came together. Uh, others still uh, have pointed to really, um, I don't want to say a coincidence, but the, the, the coming together of the planets Jupiter and Venus, which we know by studying uh, you know, the constellations and the movement of the stars, that those two planets did indeed align in, uh, in June, actually we can tell you the day, June 17th in the year 2 BC, that those planets came. And so people say, wow, what an amazing aligning of events. P possibly there's an explanation for these things. You know, the other uh, Saturday night, two weeks ago, I was walking home after prayer, uh, praying in the sanctuary from 8 to 9 p.m. And then it was a little after 9, it was about 9.30. I was walking home and it was dark outside. It was a beautiful, clear night. And as I'm walking towards my house, I'm facing west. So facing west, so coming out of the east, all right? And I it was just, because Christmas was on my mind, the gospel was on my mind. All of a sudden, my daughter Olivia was with me. All of a sudden, both of us just stopped dead in our tracks. And I'm not kidding you, the brightest shooting star that I've ever seen, literally lit up about a third of the night sky. It just went right over the top of our house and pointed us the way back home. I mean, it was so bright. I'm not, like normally you see a shooting star and you're like, oh wow, did you see it? No, I didn't see it. I missed it. We were standing there both together. Just our mouths froze. Neither, and then after it was like, did you, did, did you, that, that, that was awesome. Like those Chris Farley interviews, remember on Saturday Night Live? Anyway, 
that was awesome. And it was just, you could see colors, and it was blue around the edges, and it was orange in the middle, and it just, I was almost waiting for an explosion or an impact to hit somewhere, uh, you know, but it was, it was remarkable, and it just reminded me of, uh, of that star that could have guided uh, these three wise men. There are, however, and I think as much as we want to try to understand the natural universe, the universe does point. It does point, indeed, to the things of God. In fact, here's a scripture for you. Let me look at a couple of scriptures. Likely, here is, a, here is a prophecy that these wise men would have been following. It's, it's, it's found in the book of Genesis. Genesis 49, in verse 10. And, and this prophecy in Genesis 49, 10 is actually the dying words of Jacob, Israel, as he is blessing his sons in his last and final breaths. He comes to his son Judah after chewing out the three oldest for the disappointments and the ways in which they have disobeyed their father. And he gets to his son Judah and he begins to speak some of the most beautiful and powerful words of of scripture that also bring this prophecy. And he says to his son Judah in 49 verse 10, the scepter will not depart from Judah nor the staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes and the allegiance of nations, of the nations, is his. And then he goes on to bless the rest of his sons. You know, this prophetic foretelling of a star that would be connected to uh, the scepter of of Jerusalem is also something that we hear in Numbers 24. Well, Well, let me look at this. Here's a scripture. Okay, Numbers 24, thank you. I skipped one, but we'll go back to it. Numbers 24, these are the words, not of, um, this is an interesting story, by the way, as we read this. Uh, This is not one of the the biblical prophets who wrote a book, but uh, we see it here, Numbers 24, 17. It says, I see him, but not now. He's foretelling the future. It says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. Now, Jewish Uh, rabbis and scholars, even to this very day, will point to both of the scriptures that we've read already today, uh, Genesis 49 and here in Numbers chapter 24, as prophecies of the Jewish Messiah. It says, a star shall come forth from Jacob. A scepter shall rise from Israel. There's the same prophecy that Jacob spoke, or that Israel spoke over his son, and shall crush through the forehead of Moab and tear down all the sons of Sheth or Seth. It's an interesting uh, prophecy here that we see that this prophecy spoke and has been a part of the hope of the Jewish people. It was spoken uh, not only in alignment with what Jacob blessed his son Judah, that out of him would rise the ruler of all Israel. He is not the firstborn, but Judah would become known and his brothers would be included in him is part of what the prophecy says. You know, it's interesting. I believe that even the word Jew or Judah or Judea is actually derivative of the name Judah. Judah, who is not the firstborn son. You know, even the nation of Israel, the father of these 12 tribes, you know, is the broad name of it. But as in Jesus' day, in first century, it is is known as the, the nation, the kingdom of Judah or Judea, and even the, the reference that we have of today to Jews is somehow connected to the name of Judah, that all of the tribes, all of the brothers are caught in him, and it is out of his tribe from Judah that Jesus himself descended, that the birth of Jesus the Messiah came, and the connection of biblical prophecy that a star and a scepter. The scepter is the symbol of rule or authority or kingship that the star would foretell the rise of the kingship. And so here in this obscure little town of Bethlehem, we see all of these coming together. Uh, By the way, you say, well, what do the stars have to do with it? Genesis chapter 1, in the very beginning, on the fourth day of creation, this is what is written. Then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons, for days and years. In other words, part of the purpose 
for which God set the stars and the heavenly bodies in, the, in their orbit is to tell signs, times, and seasons. And so the ancient Persians, for instance, by paying attention, wondering what time it is, what's going on, how are, and as things come together, they're saying, what does this mean? They are simply following what God has said. This is about what it is. In fact, uh, you know, the constellations that arise during each portion of the year were how the ancients told what month it was, by what constellation was coming over the horizon at what time. It's a part of how they knew what, not just what the weather was, but what season it was. And this is an interesting correlation, but let me just get back. I know there's a lot of details here, but let me get back to the Star of Bethlehem. Was the Star of Bethlehem the coming together of heavenly bodies to announce uh, something that God had set in motion from the very beginning? Very possibly it could be. Was the Star of Bethlehem a natural phenomena that uh, just was a part of the moving of stars and planets and the co aligning of these things? It very well could have been. However, there are some anomalies that just really don't line up or make sense. Uh, you know, these magi followed a star all the way from, for instance, Persia, a many months journey, maybe longer. They followed the star. Now, I don't know much about stars. I know my friend uh, Daryl is very into the, the, the stars and the constellations and, and people like, they, they got their telescopes and they can tell you all these kind of things. I don't know much about stars, but I'm pretty sure they all move from east to west every night or in their orbit. They all move and then they disappear. And there's a certain point at which you can't see them any longer until the next time they come around. Uh, how is it then that these guys followed it all the way and it didn't disappear? You say, well, maybe it did, but they just knew where it was going to come up again, and they kind of followed that trajectory. Okay, maybe there's a natural explanation for it. But, but why is it that the star then indeed didn't guide them to Bethlehem? The star guided them where? To Jerusalem. Perhaps it is that the star didn't guide them to Jerusalem, but their assumption, if there was a king born of the Jewish people, that uh, he was going to be in Jerusalem where the, where the throne was. And so that's why they went to Jerusalem. Uh, that, that could possibly be. And so as they visited Herod, and we'll talk about him in just a moment as we conclude, but how is it then that this very same star, as they were guided to Jerusalem then, uh, from Jerusalem, guided them to the south, to Bethlehem, to the very place, the house that Jesus was in? So... I don't know, unless the star all of a sudden changed its axis and instead of going from east to west, all of a sudden went from now north to south. Unless, and, and here, here's what I'm getting at. This story of the birth of Jesus the Messiah, already, friends, by faith, we have accepted that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of a virgin. So we, we should not feel the need to naturally explain every detail that God is pointing to. You know, the Bible is a logical book by many means, but it is a book of faith. And the scriptures tell us, and it, it's not interested in giving us an astronomy lesson so much as it is interested in seeing how it is that people come to Jesus Christ. How do people come to Jesus Christ? Now, Psalm 19 tells us that the, the very universe, the stars and the planets, night after night, they point to God. They, they tell his story. Indeed, they do. But we don't have to shoehorn everything into a natural understanding. But we can also know that there are a very great number of natural uh, ways to understand what is happening in the supernatural here. Um, the last kind of clue that we see is that the, the star literally guided them, pinpoint guided them to a specific house to a specific house. This, my friends, even if it was a star, even if it was the aligning of planets, if it guides somebody to a specific house, is a miracle. It is a miracle, make no, stake, make, make no mistake about it. And God spared no expense in orchestrating such a miracle to point people to the worship and adoration of his son Jesus, to, of his son Jesus Christ. Now, let's just go back to Jerusalem for a second, to the response of Herod, and, as the Bible says, the whole city of Jerusalem. Because these magi show up, and they are elated. 
they are so excited about not only the prophecy, but that prophecy wasn't just living on the pages of books, but it was being visible in the world around them, and it was guiding them on a real journey. Do you know this, friends? This is a good reminder to us that the Word of God isn't just something that lives on pages. The Word of God is, as the book of Hebrews tells us, living and active. The Word of God can literally guide us through the decisions and the steps and the journeys of our lives. The Word of God is real. And these, these magi were elated to be living out the Word of God. But this wasn't the response of everybody. They go to Jerusalem, they say to Herod, hey, we've got great news for you. We heard there's a new king born. A new king born. By the way, that's not how it works. Kings aren't born. Uh, kings are born as princes. And then at a certain point of time, they become kings. Uh, Herod was the king, as he was called, of the Jews during that period of time. Uh, by the way, I think it was Caesar, uh, Caesar Augustus that said this of Herod. You would not want to be born in, in Herod's household. Uh, he killed some of his own sons because he thought they were trying to steal the throne of him. Caesar Augustus said this, it would be safer to be one of Herod's pigs than one of his sons, which tells us a lot about Herod. First of all, he's not a very good Jew if he's got pigs. I'm just saying, forbidden, not kosher. Uh, secondly, that he is not a very good human being if he treats his sons worse than he would treat his animals. And so it was a very well-known fact, and Caesar Augustus actually was not wrong about him. But um, we see these varying responses. The wise men came, and they said, we've seen his star. By the way, whose star was it? It was Jesus' star. That's all we really need to know. It was his. We've seen his star, and what have we come to do in response to that? Based on what we have read, what we have seen, and what we know, and what we believe, we have come to worship him. This is their response to God's revelation in their heart and life. Limited though it was, but it was sufficient to, to spark their hearts to worship God. To worship God. To worship Jesus. So, here's what we also see. Herod's response to the very same revelation was it says that he was greatly disturbed. And you know who else was? The whole city. The whole city. One of the questions that uh, Kurt and I were talking about before service, he says, well, you know, how did this story get known to Matthew as he's writing the gospel? I mean, did Joseph tell him? And we presume that Joseph died at a certain time. I said, you know what? Very likely he could have interviewed Joseph in his, in, in his quest for the information, or Mary could have told him. But you know, when it comes to the visit of the Magi, it was about the most public occurrence possible. Because not only did they come to see the king, or, or the ruler, Herod, but also Herod spread the news to all of the scribes and scholars and Pharisees and the religious leaders of the day. Hey, we got some visitors here and they're asking me questions. I need to know the answer. Where's the Messiah to be born? And they said, oh, in Bethlehem. In Bethlehem. And they quote a, a prophecy out of the book of Micah that tells, again, not just that a star or the scepter would come from Judah, but very specifically Bethlehem, the house of bread. Bethlehem, or in the ancient days as it was known, Ephrathah. And so some, some scriptures and some passages you'll read, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, are not least among the tribes of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler. And so he, they, the, the details become clearer and clearer, but Herod's response, along with all of those uh, who surrounded him, was one of being disturbed. Here's an interesting correlation. If there truly was one who was born king of the Jews, that is no threat to the Persians. By the way, it's no threat to the Persians of today either. The, the prince of peace, the king of kings and the lord of lords being born a, a king of the Jews is good news for all Persians. It is. It was good news then. They were not threatened by this news because they recognized Man, this is, this is beautiful. This is good. It was because they stood only to gain from it. Only to gain. Herod, however, if what they were saying was true, he actually stood to lose quite a bit. As well as many of the people that surrounded him, the important people of Jerusalem. For if the one who was to be born king of the Jews were to come along, it would mean this. Herod, you're out of a job. It would mean this. All the people who eat out of your table are probably out of a job as well. All of the suck-ups, the yes-men, the, the, you know, these celebrity chasers, the, 
ancient paparazzi. Their whole way of life was being challenged or threatened by that which was to be good news to all men. And it is interesting to see that their response, their response was to be disturbed by the very thing that elated not only the Magi, but the shepherds, Mary and Joseph. Talk about who stood to lose the most from this story being true, Mary and Joseph. But their response, as we've read over the last few weeks, was, Lord, whatever you say, we'll do. Because we know that even if it looks like a threat, if it comes from you, we know it's good. Because we know you are, you are good. The other thing that we see here is a, is a false religious spirit that comes out of Herod and those around him. Because he says this, oh, oh, tell me where he is because I also want to what? Worship him. That's a lie. But it, it displays a religiousness. It displays piety. But it, it actually, in his heart, was envy, was the desire to eliminate and to murder a baby, which we see he makes good on that promise, Not, but he doesn't hit Jesus, but he indeed brings great suffering to all the families of Bethlehem with little ones, and we see it later in chapter two. You see, Herod the Great, uh, as he was called, was great in man's eyes. In fact, many of the accomplishments, buildings, plans of Herod still stand to this day. You can see evidence of Herod's great building projects. You can go and see the great building project that would be his tomb that he built. He built, literally, he built himself a mountain where there was none. He built a mountain for him to be buried in. It's a pretty amazing, Herodium, it's a pretty amazing in the Judean wilderness, uh, the fortress of Masada. The fortress of Masada overlooking uh, the, the Dead Sea is a, is a fortress uh, that Herod built that he could flee to. Herod built the great temple. Uh, uh, the second temple in Jerusalem. And uh, Herod's projects and the scope of his vision was just remarkable. But really, Herod was only great by man's standards. By man's standards. You know, this last week, uh, my friend John Stanford was a part of our, our pastoral staff and prayer meeting. And, and he just said, I just can't get this out of my mind that at the birth of John the Baptist being foretold, the angel said of John that he would be great. He would, John would be great. He says, and I just, I just, I want to be great like John was, but it doesn't look like anything that the world calls great. And I've been thinking about that. You know, Jesus said in Mark chapter 10, and I'll invite our worship team to join me, if you will. Jesus said this, hearing his disciples really debate this question of what does it mean to be great? You know, you got titles like Herod the Great, you know, great this, great that. People are like, yeah, let's do something big. Let's make a significant impact. Let's leave a legacy beyond ourselves. You say, what does it take to be great? And they're, they're arguing among themselves about who is greater. Who's going to be the greatest of all of them? You know, ego gets in the way of a lot of good ministry, by the way. And this is something that Jesus speaks directly to in Mark 10, verse 42. It says, calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, you know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. He's speaking of the Romans and by proxy, even Herod, who ruled really as an extension of Roman power. They lord it over them. In other words, they use their authority, they use their position and their greatness to feed themselves, to care for themselves, to bring luxury to themselves and to push others down. And their great men exercise authority over them Verse 43, but it is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. In verse 45, a verse which you're likely familiar with. For even the Son of Man, and he's speaking of himself, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, friends, we see in this story, this insignificant and obscure little town with amazing, miraculous foretelling and prophetic utterance from millennia before, from generations before, that is observed and followed by some of the great people of their day, these magi who came to observe that was a great threat to the leaders of their day. We see that the greatest of all 
was born? Jesus. And it's interesting that the greatness of this story is yes, in the person of Jesus, but it is also in this. How is it that people are drawn to him? How is it that people are drawn into God's plan through him and his story? You know, I know that today we've all been experiencing different pressures, different things that are kind of imposing their will upon us. And I just wanna tell you right now, that even things that you wanna blame on Caesar, God is working through. Even things that you wanna see, well, that's somebody else's fault, or I can't believe this, and man, God, whatever. God is working. God is drawing us closer to Jesus Christ, even as this world around us continues to shake, and the things that really are not eternal are shaking. It is a reminder to us that we are to be drawn to Jesus. And Jesus, the greatest of all, said that in the midst of all of it, I came to serve. I came to serve. Not to be served, but to serve others, to lay down my life. And that as my life is lifted up on the cross, people will see what true greatness is, and they will be drawn to eternity with him. Eternity with our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the point of the star. That's the point of the star. Actually, there's one more point of the star. Can I just read you one last verse? One of the, la one of the last verses in the entire Bible. Jesus, not only was his birth foretold by a star, but Jesus himself, l well, let me just read it for you. It's really remarkable. Jesus, in Revelation 22, the last book in the last chapter of the Bible, verse 16. Just listen to these words. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. Jesus, again, is referring to the, the nativity, the birth the kingdom of David. And he's saying, I was, I'm, not only am I the one who was the beginning of David's family, but I'm the descendant of his family. Friends, we may not have seen the star that guided us to Jesus, but Jesus himself says, I am the morning star. I am the one that calls to you today, Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. God has established the times and seasons. He has set forth everything we need to see and know to be drawn to Jesus. And so today we respond. We respond to him. Would you just pray with me as we close our time together? Respond to Jesus today. Respond to Jesus today. Maybe it's the shaking of your life. Maybe it's the things that are being taken out of your life. Maybe it's the pressures that you feel. But I don't know. You, you, different things are moving your life in different directions. And I just want to encourage you today. Would you draw near to Jesus rather than be disturbed like Pharaoh or like like Pharaoh in the Old Testament, but like Herod in the New Testament? Would you be drawn to Jesus? Would you be guided by this, the beautiful star, not the star of Bethlehem, but the, the morning star, Jesus Christ, today? And I just wanna ask you to respond to Jesus today. And in your heart, in your heart, to believe in him as God's one true way of salvation. The one who died for us, the one who was raised to life again, and the one who is coming. Jesus, we acknowledge you today. We believe in you today. We receive you into our hearts today. And we ask that you would not only guide us to yourself, but continue to guide us through every day of our life, through your word, through your living word, through your Holy Spirit that we receive by believing in you. God bless your church today. Draw others into your church in this season. May we indeed be like stars shining in this universe, drawing people to the righteousness of God, which is in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Friends, would you stand with me, please? Two things left to accomplish today. Number one, I just wanna speak our blessing. And number two, I wanna invite you to come and to just pray for a few moments around this altar. God is working, God is drawing. How will we respond 
in this day. So may the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile down upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, the morning star, Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen. Amen. Friends, if you'd like to pray, I'd love to meet you at this altar and agree with you in faith, whether it's healing, whether it's wisdom, whether it's grace, or whether you just simply want to come and adore him today. We're so grateful that you joined us here today at Cedar Park Church. We know there's a lot of ways that you could be spending your time, but we're thankful that you are here with us. And we pray that it was a meaningful time, that you were encouraged, that you heard from the Lord. That's right. And even though we're separated by time and space, we want you to know that it's important to us that you're with us today. And we're praying for you and believing in God's best for your life. And whether you're watching online because you're traveling or out of town, or maybe you're just checking out church, we would love the opportunity to say hello to you in person soon. So may God bless you and thanks for spending your time with us today.